steps in building a mathematical model. This video is part of a course on food physics of which this belongs to the modeling section. It is the last one of a three-part series on conceptual introduction to modeling. So a separate video talked about rationale for building a mathematical model of a physical process. Then another video talked about generic principles behind building a mathematical model. So we are now here. In this video, we're going to talk about the generic steps involved in building a typical mathematical model. So what is modeling? And of course, in this case, we're thinking of physics-based model. Now, modeling can mean different things to different people. It's analogous to a group of blind men describing an elephant, depending on which part of the elephant uh, is touched by the person. So modeling can be theory, it can be governing equations, boundary conditions, it can be just math in general, um, thinking of modeling just a lot of math, or it can be just computational software. Oh, it's a console model or an ANSYS model. In reality, modeling is all of that and more steps like validation. So let's break down modeling into its most important steps. So here they are. We start from a food process and develop its governing equations and boundary conditions that would be called the mathematical analog of the food process. This is called the problem formulation stage. Once we have these equations, then we need to solve the equations. So we can implement those in a software, or of course we can write our own and then try to solve those equations. Once we have the solutions, that's just solution to the equations that we provide. We still have to compare that with the real process, and that is called the validation stage. Once the model is validated, then we run the model or produce a lot of simulation results for different what if scenarios in design and optimization um, context. And so that is called the sensitivity analysis. Once we have these lots of results, then we have to kind of distill the critical information from these results and communicate uh, to those uh, that, that the project is meant for. Uh, the modeling project uh, it was meant for in the context of a product design or a process design. So for that, of course, we have written report and uh, oral communication. Now, all of the steps that you see here, there is, of course, a better way to do this. And we have videos for, uh, for example, the problem formulation, separate video for problem formulation. We also have some videos for implementing uh, equations in a particular software. Then we also have videos for uh, written report and oral presentation. Uh, and of course, we have covered validations and sensitivity analysis. So these are all separate videos. We're not getting into those um, right here. So let's have a quick uh, overview of this one step, the problem formulation step. Now here is an example of problem formulation where the real physical process is replaced by its mathematical equivalent consisting of goals, schematic, like this one here, and governing equations, boundary conditions, initial conditions, properties, and parameters. 
All of these are discussed in great details in a separate video on problem formulation. So here we're not getting into all of the details, but simply to introduce those steps. So here is just another graphical representation of the modeling process where we start from some real process of interest, develop its mathematical model consisting of equations, and then we solve the equations in a software generating results. So this first step uh, is what we are calling problem formulation, going from real process to its mathematical model. This is where our interest is at this moment and why is this step very very critical because it's where it's where we are making the biggest change uh, from a physical process to its mathematical equivalent from a real from reality to its mathematical equivalent and the thing is we in this process make a lot of assumptions a lot of errors in the next step of solving this equation, even if we make zero error in producing uh, results, these uh, zero error in this step is not going to get rid of the errors that we have already made in the problem formulation step. So they are to stay with us and so that's why it's very critical to do this process right now if we um, are going to make this uh, step very detailed it can make the model uh, really too difficult to compute if we make it too simple then we could lose uh, some critical physics so we have to do just right and so that eventually these simulation results would be representative of the real process. So this problem formulation step can be broken down further into a number of detailed uh, steps that will go over quickly. It is advised that you think of these steps in the context of your model as I go through these uh, quickly. Now we want to go through these steps quickly, but as I mentioned earlier, there's separate video that goes into details of each uh, step. So the first one is setting the goal for the modeling. Now we of course have some goal in mind all the time, but quite often this goal that we have in mind is qualitative in nature and that's not very helpful for a modeling project. For example, we could be thinking, oh, it should taste good. Uh, this is not sufficient in a modeling project because it, it, all the model can do is compute numbers. And so whatever quality we are thinking of, it needs to be computable. Uh, so in this meat cooking example, uh, if we relate uh, the texture of the meat uh, by Young's modulus and we know how the Young's modulus changes with temperature, moisture, etc. Then we can compute quality directly and then we can set some sort of a goal in terms of reaching certain level of quality. So it is important to set our goal quantitatively that can be computed by uh, our models, like reaching a certain temperature or reaching a certain bacterial level or reaching a certain temperature uniformity. How we set the goal decides how we do the remaining steps of how we build the model. As I suggested earlier, you could pause the video and think of what could be the goal in your modeling project. Next step in our problem formulation could be the geometry of the product 
or the process that we are trying to model. We can think of geometry being included in two different ways, broadly speaking. One is we approximate the geometry, approximate like 1D or 2D or um, axisymmetric or approximate its shape and just draw the geometry. The other group would be acquiring the exact geometry using uh, these techniques. We may be able to download the exact geometry from some geometry databases. So again, what would be the way you would like to um, get your geometry? One of the most important steps is the choice of governing equations that we will choose to represent the real physical process. Here we ask questions like what physics, what equations do we choose for that physics and which terms in those equations do we keep and which ones do we drop? So how do we apply those principles? Let's try on deep frying. So in deep frying, we can think of the, there is definitely heat transport and there is water transport because uh, they are uh, losing water. There's vapor transport. There's also oil transport, uh, for example. And so each one of these physics is described by the fundamental conservation equations. So let's say heat transport is uh, described by the energy equation. Now that energy equation has many different physics in it. So many different terms in the equations like transient, uh, flow term, diffusion term, generation, and evaporation. So here is where the critical uh, insight into the process comes as much as we have before actually modeling the process as to which tar, which physics are likely to be most important so we keep those terms. So to decide this, uh, the modeler needs to be comfortable with those physics before getting into the modeling of the physics. So here is where I want to remind that we don't get into modeling a physics if we don't know the physics and simply have a software. That's not the way to go. First, we need to learn the physics. So again, you can pause and think of the physics that uh, could be involved in the model that you are trying to build. Repeating something from an earlier video, as we try to decide on the physics uh, as to which one do we include and which one we don't, the principle that we follow is this one. As simple as possible, but no simpler. We do not want to keep physics that make it unnecessarily complex, and neither do we want to make it too simple uh, and throw out some important physics. Boundary conditions is our next step, and some of the comments made for governing equations also apply here. Getting the right boundary conditions is just as important. It is not so obvious, uh, you know, we're used to assuming uh, simple boundary conditions in our earlier classes where we want to get analytical solution but here we want to get more realistic solutions. So to make the model more realistic, we need to have the boundary conditions match the reality as much as possible. And this is often a very difficult and challenging part in building a model. So again, you can think of what boundary conditions would be relevant for your model. The last two items on the list are properties and parameters. Properties like viscosity or parameter like heat transfer coefficient. Now, these are approximated from available literature, at least to get started. Then depending on how the model goes and what the model says, we may need to come back and measure some of these more accurately. To summarize the problem formulation step, then we are replacing a real physical process 
with equations that describe the physics of the process these equations are yet to be solved so we haven't solved them we just developed a mathematical model out of a real physical process as problem formulation leaves us with equations our next step is to solve these equations typically the equations that we got after problem formulation we implement them in an existing software and the software makes the solution process fairly automated. It, this sounds great, except that the very nature of this numerical solution process used in such, such software is that no universal approach will work for all the set of equations that can come out of a particular process. This means the user needs to tweak the solution process. For a complex model, this could be one of the most time-consuming efforts. Even the implementation of our model in the software is non-trivial because the equations that we got doesn't have to you know, agree or doesn't have to fit the templates that are already built into the software. Many of the time it works, but not always. Of course, we can write our own code, but that is becoming more and more rare as many software and user-friendly software are becoming available. Because of the nature of the solution, and also because we're not writing our own code, we cannot use the software as black box. We must know the physics and learn the software and the proper use of the software. Otherwise, we can easily end up with garbage in, garbage out. As just said before, a lot of the time is spent in just making uh, the solutions converge making the solutions work. So back to the modeling process, we are in this step here. We are implementing the mathematical model uh, to be solved in the computer. So we're calling that the computer model. So we make errors in this step and we want to keep these errors to a minimum and there are formal ways to try to reduce this error. For example, something called mesh convergence. So we try to reduce this error in a uh, formal way. So the software implementation step, uh, this one, is not a trivial one either. Our next critical step is validation. So here is another look at the big picture of modeling. We make errors in problem formulation where we make assumptions and so on, and we make errors in the software implementation or solving those equations. How much error, we do not know. So a critical process is to compare our simulation results with something obtained independently. Typically, this means comparing with experimental data. This step is called validation. And it's one of the critical steps in modeling. We cannot accept our solution unless we have validated the solution in some way. Moving past validation, when our model is validated, our most difficult parts are over. We now use this model to simulate many what-if scenarios in a design context and then uh, perform optimization. In this example, a very simple one, we are just talking about sensitivity of a 
model, in this case, a drying process, how the average moisture changes with time and its sensitivity to various mass transfer coefficients. Now, why various mass transfer coefficients? Because it could vary legitimately during a process or it could be unknown in the model. So by doing this kind of sensitivity analysis, we can answer a lot of important questions about the model or how it's going to be interpreted. Finally, we come to the critical step of making sense of the simulation results from a model and communicating these simulation results to the right persons. Engineering modeling of the kind we are discussing takes time, effort, and resources. Mostly is not done for fun, rather it is often done in a design context to obtain directionality as to which way to go in designing a product or a process. A simulation of a model can produce massive amounts of data, plots, and so on. It, to distill all this to what the user needs or can use is non-trivial. For the modeler, like many of us, it is very easy to stay focused on just the modeling details. However, no one seems to care about these modeling details except us as the modeler. So everybody else wants to know what the implications are. And so we have to distill all the results and simulations that we do into uh, tangible things that others can use. And that's why the communication part plays a critical role. Remember, the modeling project's goal generally is to convince someone of something using the results from the model simulation. If we cannot convince or we have not learned anything, then the model was probably not worth doing. So typically, the model results are communicated in two complementary ways, written report and oral communication. We have a separate module discussing details of these steps. Here we summarize the typical steps in a modeling process from this video. Uh, first, we do the problem formulation where we take a physical process and write its mathematical analog, which is the governing equation, boundary conditions, and so on. And then the next step is to solve those equations and that is implementation of the model in a software. And then once we start to get solutions, we need to validate the solutions. So that's like our third step. And once the model is validated, then we generate lots of what if scenarios. So that's the sensitivity analysis. And finally, we make sense of all these results uh, by distilling them into written reports and oral uh, presentation that's part of the communication of the results. So we just completed the third part of this three-part intro to modeling. The previous uh, parts were uh, rational for modeling a process and the general principles to be followed in modeling a process. So this concludes the three-part introduction to modeling. The next video in this series goes into the details of one of the steps, the problem formulation step.